I've always known I wanted to be a geneticist since really eighth grade, and so I really I actually even got really impatient in college. My undergrad was in genetics, my PhD was in genetics, postdoc was in medical genetics. I did a, a fellowship at the law school on genetics and intellectual property, so it's always, it's always genetics all the time. When I'm in the shower, I'm thinking about genetics. So I've always known, known that, but the deep dive into the microbiome happened uh, more recently. In fact, it was really two things that drove it. One is every time you sequence a human genome from somewhere in your body or your skin, a lot of the DNA is human, of course, but it'd always be fragments of DNA that you've just sequenced, and you know it should go to some organism, but it didn't map to anything. It wasn't human for sure, and you couldn't figure out what it was. Of course, we know now a lot of this microbial DNA. The second thing that happened is I became a father and uh, watched my daughter explore the world around us, and even at certain points, watched her lick a subway pole. Really became very curious about what happens when your mouth touches lots of public surfaces. Like what, what does that exchange look like? How transient is it? How much of, of my tongue is left behind or vice versa when you actually have such a unique uh, interaction with the environment? Yeah. I thought, well, in the absence of knowledge, the best thing to do is explore. So we started to explore. People look at a rainforest generally with awe and wonder and curiosity because they think there could be new animals, there's new drugs, there's new plants, all this biodiversity left to discover. The really shocking thing is we see the exact same thing on a steel railing in a subway is that on average, Half of the DNA matches no known organism and represents new peptides, new potential molecules, new even antibiotics. So we can actually track antibiotic resistance and then also find new antibiotics with the exact same set of data. When I first started my lab, the very first grant that I wrote was actually what's called an unsolicited proposal to NASA. And I thought, you know, there's never been a genetic study of, of really astronauts. So then fast forward about 18 months, Mark and Scott Kelly were at a press conference because Scott said, okay, I'm gonna be going up to space for a year. And then one of the reporters said, well, hey, don't you have a twin? Are you guys gonna do anything with that? Well, when again are we gonna have a chance to have identical twins and have one in space for the longest mission ever for a NASA astronaut? We probably should do something. So uh, my lab was one of the 10 labs that were selected for this really large study to look at everything we possibly could about the body and the physiology uh, of an astronaut in space for a year. We discovered a number of things about the body uh, and also ways to get things from the body during this mission. So it was called the NASA Twin Study. We developed new protocols to get blood actually drawn from space, put into a tube, dropped down in the Soyuz capsule into Kazakhstan, and get it into Houston and then sort cell blood cells and we could still get viable cells that hadn't even been frozen within 35 hours from space. One of the most important facets of research is just making sure the sample is what you think it is. So you wanna collect the sample well, preserve it well, and then also have it be processed in a uniform and reliable fashion in the lab. So some of the things that actually we use, like the, the Thermo Fisher, the 2D matrix tubes, you know, you don't just want one barcode on a tube, you want redundancy. You wanna make sure that if something falls off or gets scratched, you have a second way to confirm it. The tubes have to be stable. You have to be able to ship them also ideally at room temperature. So we've looked a lot at preservative agents that can keep DNA and RNA stabilized even at room temperature. So I think, you know, a lot of the products uh, that we use routinely in the lab ensure the, the integrity of that process of the sample and then also how it gets eventually uh, used in the lab. This is the most exciting time in genetics. Actually, every single day you wake up is the best day to be a geneticist because there's more sequence data, more functional information, more information in general every day that's being made than has ever existed before. So that means that empirically, every day that I wake up is the best day to be doing my job. It's a great day to be a scientist.